Good afternoon. We uh, begin again, and uh, this time I'm going to complete my uh, two uh, lectures. One lecture is just over. The second one is going to be on FMEA. And uh, in this, we take a look at how we can predict the uh, rate of failure of certain products. These could be finished products or these could be, for example, a process. So this is quite often utilized right at the design stage. Right at the design stage itself, you'd like to do FMEA to try to make sure you can prevent, you can take all these preventive steps to uh, look at the manner in which a product or service may fail. The outline of this, uh, our stock is going to be, uh, what is FMEA, a little bit about the history of it, what are the benefits, what will be the applications of FMEA, this is something you'd like to be able to see. The procedure for doing it, I'll take, give you a glimpse of the worksheet which is there and a couple of examples and a summary. This is what my plan is for this session with you. What exactly is FMEA? It's a technique to try to improve system performance or to try to design systems that would resist failure. Both of those are, those are achieved by doing FMEA. Why do you do FMEA? Well, first of all, let's try to understand the definition and the purpose and the benefits and so on. I should just caution you that FMEA is a team approach. It generally cannot be done by just one person trying to work out uh, the details of it. Something we've got to remember is uh, the whole purpose for FMEA is try to reduce, is basically try to reduce the impact of failures. And in doing that, what it really does is, is prevents a lot of crisis. If you would not do FMEA, then the design or the process would be released as is without any kind of, uh, you know, kind of prediction of uh, the uh, chance that it might fail, it may, may fail to function as uh, required or it may fail to deliver the function that it, the performance that is, that is again expected out of it. That is something that would be there if we do not do FMEA. In F so FMEA is kind of a preventive predictive technique, that's what it does. And it leads to actions, it leads to actions that will lead to improvement in performance. What exactly is the result? Well, there are two dimensions. Whenever something breaks down or some failure takes place, there are, generally speaking, two or three things that happens. I'm going to show you that slowly. The first thing, of course, is there is the severity of the impact. That can be high or low, depending on the nature of the feedback, nature of the failure that took place. You might get some feedback saying that the impact was high or the impact was low. The, uh, the other aspect is the probability of it, the probability of it occurring. That, again, can be high or low. So if you've got a situation when you've got a high probability of failure and the impact is large and that the consequence, the adverse consequences lead to things that you do not really want, then you've got a high risk situation and that is that red area there. If you look at the, uh, if you look at the picture there, there is that red area and that actually says, says <coughs> if my product ends up there, if my process ends up in this area, I've got to make every effort to either reduce basically the uh, likelihood, so I should try to push it down this way or I should try to take some preventive steps so I can, I can reduce the impact. The whole idea is to shift a process or a system which is here more to this side, more to this side. As you go from here to here, basically you're trying to reduce the impact, also trying to reduce the likelihood. And this is achieved by doing FMEA. This exactly, this objective is achieved by doing FMEA. Let's take a look at the output. What exactly happens at the output? Now, uh, if we look at the system for a few minutes, for a couple of minutes, you'll find there are certain components in the system and that has gone through, this particular system has already gone through some kind of uh, FMEA analysis. So the component names are given there, the components that make up the system, then failure modes, in what different ways could that component fail, for example, loose wiring or, or a failure of a plug or something like that itself. What are the causes of that failure? It could be vibration or something else that also is, is pinned down there, then the effect of that failure. Causes of the failure would lead to, uh, and then again, you've got something called the effect of the failure, then the correction of the problem. What are things I can do to try to reduce either the impact or the likelihood of that thing? And then I put some general comments there. And this is what I do with every component that makes up the system itself. So this is going to be, this worksheet is going to be the output. At the end of your FMEA analysis, you'll end up with a worksheet like this. And of course, in addition, you'll also end up with uh, with some priorities because you could do many different things. And the FME approach 
the FME approach also tells you, it gives you a sorting of priorities. It tells you what are the things that you must take some steps to try to try to prevent now, try to take some corrective action now. What are the other things that will probably, that could probably wait and you'd probably take some time to figure those things out and probably take some corrective action. But the ones that have high likelihood of failure and also have a high impact, those actually are the ones that should be addressed as quickly as you can. When you do that, you're really following a structured approach. You'll identify the potential failure modes. You'll basically identify what different ways could this system fail. You assess the failures to determine the prioritizing actions. And this is something that we got to be able to do because you must want to attack the, the more important ones first. Then of course, once you've gone through the analysis, you've got to document the process. You've got to make sure you, you release the action items to those people who are supposed to be uh, able to act on this. FME is in intended to basically rate the severity of failure mode. Failure modes are those different ways by which a product could fail or a service could fail. Identify actions to reduce the occurrence, basically to impact the likelihood itself. And of course, test the adequacy of controls. You might have some control, uh, control actions put in place. You'd like to probably check them out in that the control actions themselves do not fail. This is something you'd like to be able to do. Some history of FMEA, it was created by the aerospace industry in the 1960s to try to make sure that uh, there were no, not, not as many failures. And flight is something that can cost to, that can lead to a loss of life. That's something very, very uh, costly and you'd like to avoid as much as you can. And of course, the loss of the equipment, that also is something you'd like to minimize. Ford began using this in the automotive area to try to reduce uh, breakdown, breakdowns of cars. And uh, it was adopted by the big three when they moved slowly towards US 9000. They started using FMEA. The big threes are the GM, the Chrysler and Ford. These are the big three automakers. They started using FMEA. And the Automotive Action Group, Industry Action Group, this is a group that basically <coughs> formalizes a lot of action which are going to be there to benefit the companies, to benefit these three auto companies there. So what does, what are the benefits of FMEA? Safety is something that you get out of this. You improve quality and also improve reliability. All those three things you basically impact. If you continue with the benefits, the potential benefits can be, can be potential. Now those are, those are the previous ones for the real benefits. Now there are some potential benefits. The company image may improve. User, user satisfaction is also something that might also improve. Lower development cost because you've already done FMEA. It probably puts you on the, at, a, at a higher ground sort of. And also the presence of a historical record. This is also something that's like a benefit. You'll find out how did I reach certain decision decisions during design or in the development stage. What all, what all things did I go through to try to do this? That comes very handy when you're trying to do the same job again. You've got a history there. And uh, the applications where you can apply FMEA is concept development when you're just basically trying to conceive a new product. That's like one place you could probably use uh, FMEA. Design FMEA, this is called DFMA. This is uh, DFMA. This is uh, one place where uh, FMEA can be very, very effective because you are really trying to prevent before the new product comes along, before the new design is uh, converted to a manufactured product, you're trying to predict as much as you can about the uh, likelihood of its failure. This is something you'd like to be able to do as much as possible. And of course, process FMEA. So many processes, they break down in process. And you'd like to be able to see, can I, can I reduce the likelihood of its failure or its impact? This is something you'd like to be able to do. Now, more and more, services are becoming a very significant aspect of our uh, our economy worldwide, globally. And services can also fail because of a variety of different reasons. So we are also getting into now doing FMEA for services. And of course, equipment. FMEA is done for there also. If you're trying to do, if you're looking for a procedure, you've got to start at the component level. And you'd like to see uh, what are the functions of each of these parts and sort of try to come up with some sort of a uh, basis to, to say that the product or the components may fail in this manner. This is something you should be able to do. If you continue with the procedures, you determine the effects of those failures there. This is something you'd like to be able to figure out. And uh, then, of course, the severity. What is the impact and what is the likelihood? Both of these things you've got to figure out. 
as much as possible, whatever, whatever it is you are trying to improve. It could be, for example, the cover of this. It could be the cover of this CD. This could fail in certain ways. It may actually damage the disk. The disk is inside. And if this design is not right, it may actually end up damaging the disk. Or it may just come off the locks. It may come off the hinges, for example. Or it may crack, or it may scratch the disk, and so on. So, so many different ways. This cover itself could really lead to a failure, a failure of the total system. So you'd like to basically understand the different ways it could fail. That will be the mode. Then you'd like to make sure what is the likelihood for this happening, and then what is going to be the impact. And then will I be able to detect? With that, you'll probably work at various components. For example, you might look at the hinge, you might look at the cover, you might look at the plane surface there, the, the finish of it, and so on and so forth. That uh, little paper that is there, for example, some some paper, some paper is there. Can that come off? Can that actually do interact with the disk in any manner at all? When the disk is put in place, it should not the surface, the the surface underneath should not probably touch the bottom of the thing. So, in fact. There should be some some design modification right there. You may not be able to see it, but there should be some some projection there that holds the disk. It's a very delicate thing. It should be held there in the right place in the right place, and it should be portable also. Uh, also, I should be able to carry this in my suitcase, for example, or in my briefcase. Or sometimes I put it, stick it right with my laptop, and I carry it across town and so on. So that's all something that this this guy should be able to prevent. My my. Loss is going to be loss of data, loss of the disk itself. That's going to be my impact. And what is the likelihood? This is something we've got to figure out. And uh, if there are actions required, then of course we'll modify the hinge or modify the stand or modify molding or do something there to try to do this. This is something we should be able to do. When you do it all, eventually you'll got you got these numbers there. You've got the likelihood and you've got the impact. These should be quantified. Then you've got something called detection probability. You should be able to detect that there is a problem there. That also is part and parcel of doing SMEA. You multiply these three quantities, which is the probability, the impact, quantified, and the detection capability. If you multiply these three, you'll end up with something that is called the risk priority number. If you end up with something that's like, if, it's, if, if detectability is low, obviously it's more serious. So you'd like to give it a rating that's high. Because it's got poor detectability. These are these are things when they are multiplied together, you end up with something called the RPN, the risk priority number. A risk priority number basically helps you to try to prioritize the different actions which are which this this particular design deserves. For example, you'd have RPN for the hinge, you'll have RPN for the surface, you'll have RPN for various things, and then that would give that would give you a hint as to well, how, what should be the priority in which I should be able to do it. You could even do FME for your glass, for example. Various ways you could damage this glass. Never mind breaking it, but when you just lay it on the on, on a surface, for example, could it could the glass get scratched? Could that impair my vision, for example? Could it collect, collect dust and so on and so forth? So those are some of the things you'd like to be able to predict as much as you can right at the design stage itself. So there is almost nothing that should escape your FME. <coughs> you end up with something that I call the uh, that we call the uh, worksheet. Here's an example. Here's an automotive company and that has got an auto assembly plant. And it's got a paint shop that has got a tank. And this tank holds different types of paints which are required to uh, paint the uh, vehicle, the, the surface of the vehicle, for example. And uh, there's, a, there's some sort of automatic system that fills up the tank, the paint tank. Then it clicks and then the uh, automatic spraying, uh, spraying starts and so on and so forth. That thing goes on. Now, one could actually ask in what different ways could the uh, function be impaired? So if you look at the worksheet now, the function is fill the paint tub. Nothing more and nothing less. Just fill the tub. Failure mode is that the high level sensor never trips. Even if the trip got, uh, the, the tank got full, the high level sensor did not trip. What is the effect of it? The, the result of this failure, liquid spills on customer floor, for example, the user. In this case, this paint, paint painting machine has been supplied by somebody else. The car manufacturer does not produce this paint, paint painting system, so it has been pr pr produced by somebody and it's been mounted there. It's been it's been installed there. So the automotive auto manufacturer is really a customer. If paint spills over, it will fall on the customer's floor. So that's like a consequence. That's like an effect. What is the severity? And the severity 
is rated on a scale that's like between 0 or 1 and 10. 10 is, of course, very severe. Severe. In this case, the engineer, he sort of felt, looking, looking at the damage and the cleanup required and so on and so forth, he gave it a rating of 8. He said, if there are frequent failures like this, that would really end up probably shutting down the production line. What are the causes? What could have caused this? Now I'm getting into that fishbone diagram. You might remember we had a we had a little diagram called the fishbone diagram where we had the effect at the end and we had various causes leading up to that. That fishbone diagram is a brainstorming tool by which you basically, people who are working in that area, they would know very well what all different things could contribute to this failure there. So that's something that I'll be doing there and I'll be tracing down to the causes. And the occurrence rating, and this is something that of course is the likelihood, how likely it is to be and they have given it a low rating, that means it's not very likely to fail there. The current controls, current control is uh, based on the, uh, you know, the uh, fill to the low level sensor, there is a, there's a low level center, sensor, there. the moment the low level sensor, you know, indicates that the tank is empty or the, the this, uh, paint uh, tub is empty, it starts pouring liquid, it tar starts pouring. It should, it should stop the moment level gets to the right level there. What is the chance of detecting that the level has been, the, 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 the tub has become full? That detection probability, they given it a number of four. The, the, the capabilities have ra 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 rated it five. And of course, how critical is it? Is it critical or is it non-critical? Now, critical is something that can lead to a loss of life or loss of property. Hopefully, those things are not happening. Just some mess on the floor, so that can be probably cleaned up. Not a, not a big deal there. So it's it's being regarded as something that's non-critical. If it is critical, action has to be there now. And then of course, you multiply eight, which is severity, times the likelihood, which is like two, which is sixteen, multiplied by detection capability, which is five. You end up with a number that is eighty. Eight zero is the RPN for this particular item there. Now, this RPN is the, is the number that will indicate how important it is for me to fix this problem there, this potential problem there. It's going to be, now this 80 is to be compared to other things that might have probably picked up an RPN of 20, 30, 40 or maybe 200. We do not really know what all different things can go wrong in this plant. So that is something we got to figure out. But before that, of course, we got to do the RPN for every kind of function that can stop because of various types of failure there. Then, what are the recommended actions? Recommended actions are perform the cost analysis of adding another sensor, halfway perhaps, between the low and high level sensors. That's like a recommendation because that's going to reduce the likelihood. And who's going to be responsible for it? There's an engineer, Mr. Ravi Kapoor, and he was told that uh, as of 10th of October 2009, kindly get this fixed. And uh, then this uh, got filed, this uh, worksheet got filed and the report we have back is uh, the action was taken and uh, the, the problem has been fixed and they have taken this corrective action which is like they have installed a uh, uh, level sensor that is halfway between the full and, and the uh, empty uh, positions. So this is this is a worksheet, this, this worksheet basically helps you identify what could go wrong, find out its impact find out its likelihood, find out its detection capability and then work out something called the RPN which is going to give you a relative importance, relative significance of fixing this problem as opposed to others. And then of course the preventive action or the, or the corrective action and then assigning this, the responsibility for taking the corrective action to someone and reporting back on saying. So just see how we have prevented a potential problem and this generally, these turn out to be a high return projects their ROIs are pretty good. And this is just a, basically a flow chart of what we went through. Assign a level to each process or system component, which we did, that is the paint job, paint tub. This is the function of each component, we also did that. It's supposed to fill up the uh, thing, list potential failure mode, we did that. Def de describe the effect of the failure there, we did that. We describe the failure severity, that also we did. Fill on the floor and so forth, determine the probability of failure, we did that. And uh, the detection rate, detection, detection rate was also something that uh, we did. Then we ended up with the with the RPN, and then of course we took took uh, action to reduce the highest risk. That's something that we did. What exactly is FMEA? If you, if you get into the nuts and bolts of this a little bit, there are two key things that you must go after. One is the failure mode. 
any errors or defects in a process design or item, especially those that affect the customer, can be potential or actual failure modes. These are the different ways the functionality can and can, can be harmed in some way or it can it can break down. And the effect analysis is the consequence. Effect analysis is basically the consequence of something has broken down, what has been the impact of it. These two things you got to keep in mind. How has it evolved? If you go back to 1940s, for example, that's when the army started first using this. The US Army started using FMEA or some variation of FMEA. Then, of course, from that point on, if you take a, take a look at today, there was a <coughs> serious application of FMEA which was uh, introduced by the Ford company in the 1970s. They had uh, a large number of uh, accident with their Pinto cars and these led to loss of life and loss of property. And there they did FMEA and they located certain, uh, certain aspects of the design that had not been properly addressed when the design was commercialized. So this is like something that the, the, the results or the action items emerged out of FMEA, doing FMEA. FM is also used to try to improve production. You may have ongoing production going, you may have an existing design that also can be done. Who are the different people who use this? All kinds of people, aviation people, nuclear power people, aerospace people, chemical industries, automotive industries, they've been doing it for a long time. And the goal really is to try to prevent, prevent accidents from occurring. That's really the goal. This is an FMEA cycle. And if you look at uh, step one, it is detect a failure mode, defect, try to find out what different ways can a product or, or a component or a service break down. So detect the uh, failure mode and look at the severity, look at the severe, well, look at the look at the severity of it, which is like what could be the impact from that you'd get to know the severity of it, what is the likelihood of it and what is the detection number. We saw all of these things when we worked, the, worked at the worksheet. Then you work out something called the RPN. Once you have the RPN, it can help you prioritize the, the, the actions, the corrective actions, as opposed to working, working, working on something else and getting your, getting your system improved. There are certain terms which are used in FMEA. There is something called FMEA. It is the manner in which the failure is observed. And the effect of the failure is basically the consequence of the failure itself that is there. Then there are other things. For example, there could be local effect end effect and so on, but, but there is the important one which is the severity, it is the consequence of that failure, Basic, basically it is the worst potential consequence of a failure and that is determined by the degree of injury, property damage or system damage that could ultimately occur, that is like something that tells you how serious could, could this matter be. And uh, let us try to see the manner in which a system fails, what, what exactly is something called the failure mode. Let us take a look at an example. In uh, how many ways can a particular, uh, let us say a vehicle can stop functioning? Uh, <coughs> engine is not working and partial function is, uh, so there, there could be that is a mode of failure, engine is not working or not all function of the engine, the engine starts but it quits, so that means not all functions are properly working. So these could be the modes, these could be the different manners, different ways by which a well, which a vehicle could could uh, would have would have difficulty starting, getting going. If you look at other examples, if you look at other examples, for example, uh, there could be technology mode. The failure could could take place because of technology. For example, if there is a spacecraft flying, and the onboard computer fails for some reason, that's a critical failure. There could be conceptual failure, and this can happen sometimes when person, a person does not fully understand how to carry out his task and this happens a lot. This could happen, for example, I will give you a couple of examples. One is, uh, you know, the people who, uh, who are at the uh, flight deck, they are uh, the flight controllers, for example, at the airport, you know, there are certain training that they have to go through. The other kind of people who also have to go, go through this kind of training is people who do weather forecasting. Uh, they forecast these uh, different, uh, they, they look at pictures and from that they with their training, they can figure out there is going to be a massive storm or snowstorm or tornado or something like that. That is something they are trained to do. There could be a conceptual breakdown there because, because, the, because the person's training is not complete or some aspect of it was not covered very well. So he, there is a conceptual breakdown there. There, of course, there could be organizational failures also. For example, you may not have the, uh, you may not have well-defined job roles. 
and the result is that uh, also people probably do not understand mission priorities and the, the result is this there is failure in salary administration because you penalize someone because he hasn't done some job the problem is probably his job the responsibilities of the roles they were not defined very well whose failure is this it's not the person's failure it is actually the organization failure organization's failure that led to this kind of consequence this is something we got to be able to do got to be able to fix if there's a weakness in design if there's a weakness of the design itself if the design of the cover is not good enough i'll probably have a problem there i i'm showing you an example here which is like a design defect look at the two parts of it these are these are these are parts that are supposed to supposed to fit together now this is the polar connection polar means there is a positive end that must go into the positive hole there there's a there's a negative end that must go in negative negative plug that must go into a negative hole there if they are of equal size you know and i know that there's every chance that someone is going to connect it backward connect the plus to the minus and the minus to the plus if the design is like this so that can lead to a massive failure that can lead to a disastrous failure tripping and everything else and fire perhaps and so on so change that to this system look at this now the plus has got a bigger plug and it's got a bigger hole there and the minus has got a narrower plug and a narrower hole there cannot be a misfit there there just cannot be a misfit by doing the plus is not going to go in there and the minus is not going to be easy for for it to be pushed in if this can't go in there so this is something that's going to prevent a misconnection a wrong connection this is like we 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 look at a modification we had this design to start with and we changed that to this design, this design which is the modified design and this actually is a way by which i am i am converting an old design to a new design and it will turn out to be a good design in the end failure mode it could result in what we call an effect and it is due to what we call a cause these are the couple of things we got to remember we got to remember that with every failure mode we have an effect and also we have a cause it is the the effect is something that actually results from it but the causes are the ones that cause the failure to occur so we got to identify these things we got to understand these things take a look at another example a text a piece of text is unreadable and that leads to the customer not being satisfied and this could be because of a variety of different things perhaps the uh, writing surface was not, was not was not smooth perhaps other problems were there and so on so forth that's why the text was not readable so there is the effect which is here dissatisfied customer but it was caused by this surface roughness so there is the effect and there is the cause of it it is due to this and many times of course you'd be able to fish this out you'll be able to basically figure out what caused what if you construct the fishbone diagram and you do something in a very disciplined way that is called brainstorming the only thing you do there in brainstorming is you do not control the the number or the different diversity of the ideas that come up that that are given by people this is something you do not try to control or do quality check on let it pour out and then hopefully some gems will also emerge as a result of brainstorming so the fishbone diagram is a great tool to try to do brainstorming and basically figure out many different ways by which this failure would have taken place could have taken place so fma can lead to brainstorming this is something you'd like to be able to figure out and uh, some procedure is given here you can follow this or you can follow any other one my favorite is to start with the fishbone diagram and to try to populate the diagram by asking people many different questions and you could use the uh, what we call the uh, post it notes so you could do anything else there are a number of alternatives available and basically what you should be able to do is let the ideas pour and there are some steps that are provided here step 1 step 2 step 3 step 4 and so on forth eventually the idea is to be able to sort out the roots to be able to get to the roots once you got the roots there you got a starting point you can actually for now looking for prevention in trying to reduce the occurrence itself or perhaps the the impact of it if you trace it down to the root you got a chance you got a good chance there and so brainstorming would be like one great way to get there now that will give you the the cause you also have to find out what is the probability that the failure will occur this is something that can occur at various different places there could be a very high chance of failure 
in which case the chance is something that I have to, I have to worry about. So, I, I look at the ranking and if it is very high that will lead to a very high RPM and I want to give it some at attention. I want to, so basically it is going to be helping you in trying to uh, prioritize the different action items. If something is likely to happen, if some failure is likely to happen, please go after it. Do not leave it alone. And then of course, you have got to look at severity also and severity or the impact of it that can be done this way. You look at the severity. If it is a safety failure, it belongs to class S. If it is unacceptable, you know, industry calls it class A. If it is a big risk, relatively big risk and correction is recommended, it will be class B, the minimum risk that will be class C. And if you are willing to live with it, it will be really class D. So, these are the different ways by which I categorize my severity. And of course, numbers could be applied here. I could probably say 10 for S, 8 for this and uh, 6 for this and uh, 4 for this and 2 for this. With that, I will have numbers and those numbers come very handy once I go out and I try to do basically what we call uh, RPN calculation. So, what are the various possible actions I will be taking? If you look at the possible actions, I will try to eliminate the fact failure or I will try, try to reduce the effect of it or I will try to reduce the occurring. So, either I eliminate it altogether by taking some design action or by rectification action or I try to reduce the effect of it. I take some preventive steps there or I reduce the occurrence. Any of these things, if these are done, they are going to impact your RPM and that is going to be a, a big, big plus. If you look at, uh, if you look at again the different alternatives that we have got, corrective actions we have got when eliminate the failure mode itself, that means I just remove the root wherever the problem started with. I minimize the severity, this could be another way to try to uh, reduce, the, reduce the impact, reduce the chance of it and improve detection. Any of these things, if you act on any of these fronts, you are going to be gaining. And lo and behold, we are back with the worksheet here <coughs> and I see there this uh, item 80, 80, this is the same paint up filling problem and it has got a RPN of 50. Hopefully, the other failure modes have led to an RPN that is less than this. Therefore, this is the one that should get some action, some action is planned here and this resulted from looking at severity, looking at the likelihood and looking at detectability. And this is a non-critical item, so I do not really have to work on it immediately, but I, it, it is something I should I should take a look at and that is assigned to an engineer and the report is that yes, he acted on 10th of October 2009 and took the corrective action there. I have, I have provided you here with a, with a worksheet and of course, you will find worksheets <coughs> either on the internet or you will find it in uh, reliability books. And uh, what I would like you to try is again, going back to the uh, bicycle problem there, we did an we did an FTA on your bicycle. Now, this time try to find out can you do an FMA on a bicycle, on the total system as a bicycle. And uh, just for one moment, I would like to ask you a question. And the question is this Are the two wheels of the bicycle, as far as reliability goes, are they in parallel or are they in series? Please try to figure out the answer. Industry uses uh, FMEA very extensively and basically, uh, you know, this is something that is done very routinely and has been prompted by the Automotive Industry Action Group, AIAG. They have basically prompted people to do FMEA and uh, you'd be doing design review. That is like something that is done. That's like another uh, mode of uh, doing FMEA, the uh, design FMEA. This is leads right into our design failure mode and effects analysis. Now, we are looking at designs themselves. And we will be following the same routine that we did for basic FMEA. Identify all the ways in which the fa failure can occur. And this of course, we are trying to do this when we got the design on the drawing board. Estimate the effect and the seriousness of the failure and recommend correct action. And the corrective action here is going to be a modification of the design. So again, design failure mode effects and analysis. This is going to be first identify the failure modes. Look at the the, the different effects of failures on customers, for example, look at the severity, look at potential causes of failures and then look for modification of the design to try to eliminate this problem there. So, details of doing FMEA, those are laid out in these different uh, slides there. Again, I have got the failure mode there, I have got the causes there, I have got the effect there. 
I've got the correction there. And I've got to make sure that this is done in a team manner because uh, it's not so easy. Uh, let's take at this example, let's take a look at this example there. There was a particular storm. There was a huge storm that uh, even brought a tornado with it. Unfortunately, the people who were watching the storm, they failed to recognize something called the mini supercell that was being formed in the storm system. They failed to recognize this because there was a shortage in their training. Now, this is something that became a major issue. But the consequence was this, yes, there was some loss of life because it was not a very teeny weeny uh, storm. It turned out to be a big tornado and it led to loss of life and property. Although it was not fortunately not very big, but it was something that people should have caught early on. And this was missed because of lack of training, lack of comprehensive training. So that was pointed at something that was there. If you look at the design, design of the total system, what is the total system here? It is the man plus the system, all the communication devices and display devices and everything else and the sensors and so on and so forth and the data analysis programs and so on. All those things together, they make it the system. The, in the final, at the end of the day, it's the person who makes that decision. And if he's not competent enough to process all these things, that could lead to a failure. And this was traced, this particular failure was traced to a problem that occurred with incomplete training of the person who was in charge of forecasting storm. Uh, here's another example of a design defect. An engineer, this guy, he was riding a train and he failed to notice a red signal due to fog. And he, this led to a major accident, a loss of life and so on and so forth. Now, this led to injuries and loss of life and of course, damage, damage to equipment. So, we saw the cause. The cause was that the person could not see the uh, red signal. And this was done by manually checking. He was looking out and he would check that way, whether the signal is up or down or is it red or is it green. Or something. He just couldn't see anything because of the fog there. And he might be coming from a different line. He might not be familiar with that area there. So, he might not be looking out to see the signal you know, from, from far, far enough distance to be able to stop the train or slow it down. That he could not do. The corrective thing would be here to do not depend on manual detection. Try to see can you provide some technology whereby this, uh, this, uh, this signal up or down, signal green or red could be detected by going there. This is something that we should be able to do. This is something that we should be able to do. And what we should really do is uh, as much as possible, we should try to see if we could uh, prevent problems like this. Uh, the bottom line is going to be again calculation of the RPM. So this is something we'd like to be able to do. We'd like to work out the components of the RPM. And again, the risk priority number, it's made up of the severity, there'll be a rating, there'll be a number of the, 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 the probability of the event taking place and the detection capability. These three things, they must come together and they should give you, if they give you a high RPM, that's a serious matter. You've got to take some action there. You've got to take some corrective action there. And these, this comes out, these numbers come out as a result of this FMEA analysis. So I've got here the same formula there. This is the severity. O is the occurrence of failure, which is the probability, and D is the detection capability. These things together, when they're multiplied, when they're multiplied, you end up with RPM. RPM is the uh, risk priority number. And that basically, if you've got RPMs on different actions there, you should really go with the RPM that's got the highest RPM. First attend that one, then go to the next one, then go to the next one, and so on. And with each of these RPMs leading up to some corrective action, that's really what you're after. So you do your FME in such a way that you're able to find these uh, high impact, high likelihood, high likelihood and uh, load detection capability items first. Once those are taken care of, then you move down to the next ones and so on and so forth. This is something we should be able to, uh, we should be able to do without any trouble at all. If, I, if I'm doing F, FMEA. So <clears throat> the summary of conducting FMEA, a cross-functional team must do FMEA, identify functions of each component, find, try to find at least one mode of failure, one mode of potential failure, define the effects, look at the severity, and look at the detection capability. This is something that you've got to be able to do. Once you've done that, you can calculate your RPM number. RPM would come very handy in terms in terms of prioritizing the different number there. Once you've done that, you you then got to be creative. You've got to then come up with solutions. And solutions would come from engineers. To try to improve performance, how do you actually do this? Either you'd like to eliminate the failure mode itself, if somehow something is there that 
breaks down because of that. Minimize the severity of it, that is also something that is like, like another course of action that is there. Reduce the occurrence, reduce the likelihood of the probability of, of it and improve detection capability. Like in our case, for the, for the railway signal, it was uh, not being able to see the red light, the red signal. That was like the problem there. So, you try to improve that by putting in some technology that will probably, uh, there might be uh, some sort of a, uh, not necessarily audio, but some other kind of signal coming through and that should be detected automatically in addition to whatever the person is trying to do. That should be there. But some failures are more preventable than others and this we have seen so many times. Let us take a look at that warning system again. <coughs> Notice here, uh, we had that uh, supercell. Supercell was formed in the uh, storm system and this led to a conceptual failure because the person did not have enough training to be able to do it. How could I change that? I could really change that by changing the technology. Perhaps I could use a different kind of technology and not be dependent on a person, not be dependent on a person to be able to recognize that because he is doing a lot of signal processing in his mind. Through his eyes, he is trying to detect very some very fine things. Should it be left like this? I mean, look at the consequence, look at the loss of property, loss of life, and look at the, the tremendous cost that would, that would lead to. I could perhaps upgrade technology and this is something we should all try to do. This is like one place where it is not very difficult to figure out what I should be doing right. You just should not hesitate to take that corrective action, that is the message. Basically doing just FMEA is not enough, you should be able to take the, uh, prevent the failure and loss. This is something for which you got to act and that is something that comes along very handy once you try to do this. Uh, in certain situations, you will try to quantify hazards and I will give you an example. If you look at uh, the uh, hazard scoring matrix, this is like another matrix. That is also very similar to what we did. We, we calculated RPN and what this guy is doing, what this matrix approach is doing, it is again, it is ranking the severity in terms of the consequences, catastrophic impact, major impact, moderate impact, minor impact. So, he has got some ratings there. And then you've got you've got probabilities, and if it's frequent and it's catastrophic, you give it this. And if it's frequent and major, you give it this number, and so on and so forth. And if it's if the probability is pretty remote, pretty infrequent, it's a minor sort of severity, you give it number one. So here I've got items here that actually have a hazard scoring that is 16 or 12 or 9 or 8 and so on. If if an item ends up, if a, if a, if a, if my FMEA leads to this sort of scores on the hazard scoring matrix. This is like another approach. In place of doing the RPN, you could do it this way and you would again end up with very similar analysis. Here is an example which is of a, which is uh, using a decision tree. So, what it says is, let us say first you have done this and then you have got a number there. If the hazard score is 8 or higher, you move this way and you try to sort of see, does a control measure exist? for the identified hazard. If it is, you have got your action done. You do not really have to go further, just activate that action there. If it is not, then you see if you could improve the detectability of that particular thing there. And then you proceed to what, what we call a hazard guided FMEA. This is something that you should be doing. If you have good detection capability, just go ahead and act. There is no real issue there. Uh, if suppose it is not a high rating, let us say rating like 3, 4, 5, 6 and so on and so forth. Then you come down this branch and then you ask yourself the question, is this a single point of weakness? If it is yes, then you probably go through the other boxes and so on. If it is not, you stop right there. If it is not a single point of weakness, you stop right there. Stop basically means you got to move on now to other actions that are possible there. So, what I would suggest is try to look up some references on hazard guided failure mode and effect analysis. Here is an example. You know this is, uh, this, this example is taken from the healthcare industry and it turns out that uh, there are certain patient alarms which are, uh, you know, they are, they are connected to the uh, patient. If there is a patient in ICU for example, you do not really have a doctor or a, or a nurse sitting there around the clock and watching every movement of the patient or his BPs or everything else changing there. That is not something that you do, but you have got alarms. 
You got the body alarmed in various ways and those alarms trigger action. <coughs> so basically what we do is in certain places, we'd like to probably provide care, obviously, and monitor alarms. This, these monitor alarms would lead to, lead to the kind of actions that we'd like to see. We got to make sure the alarms function. The alarms do not themselves break down. And for this, I'll probably have to go into this a little bit to make sure that the alarms are functional. I can rely on those alarms. I've got three there, action item number three there. Three A will have one consequence and three B will have another consequence. In three A, periodically, I check the monitor, monitor status, uh, to, just to make sure that, uh, you know, the, the alarm is active and the alarm is still looking at the person there and so on and so forth. And of course, the other part is the respond to alarm. That's also something I should be able to do once the alarm is there. So periodically checks the monitor status. So has there been an alarm? And now this step could fail if the nurse failed to check the status. That of course is something there or misread or misinterpreted the uh, the, uh, the, the alarm that came along or partially checked. Any of these things could lead to a failure there. Obviously, I would like actually to get to this point when it's like I respond to alarms. And what are the different ways? Even if there was an alarm, the person probably did not respond. This happens once in a while. Or he responded slowly or too late and by that time the patient was out of control. I mean, this is like something we should be able to do. Now, to try to get into this, you do an FMEA. To try to prevent those sort of occurrences, you get into this. So, I have here 3B1, which is like, if you look at the first there, 3B1 did not respond. Why could he not respond? Ignored the alarm, did not hear the alarm, or the alarm volume was too low, or it was in a remote location, or probably the caregiver was busy, and therefore, uh, you know, just missed the alarm. And you do exactly what we did earlier, and you come up with uh, outcomes. You come up with uh, with outcomes and action plans and so on and so forth. So we are also doing here what we had done earlier. We are doing something very close to FMEA. That's what we are doing there. Here, if you see, I've got the failure mode, which is the cause. Look at the severity, look at the frequency, and look at the actions, and look at the outcome. These, these are exactly the steps that we followed in the earlier case at all. Now, there's some slight differences between root cause analysis and so on. There are some similarities and there are some differences there. People tend to prefer one to the other. It all again depends on the industry. Engineering people, they tend to go by FMEA, and healthcare people, they may go by the hazard FMEA. That's like something that is there. We got to recall that FMEA is a tool. It allows you to prevent basically uh, system, product, or process problems before they occur. FMEA reduces cost by identifying system, product, and process improvement opportunities in the early development cycle of the product itself. And it creates a more robust process. That is something that it does. It prioritizes actions to try to decrease risk or failure. And it also helps us evaluate systems and design from a new vantage point. This is the point of view of trying to uh, be, take, take a vantage point, uh, position of uh, prevention. This is something that we try to do. FMEA is, of course, a systematic process. And we've gone through the steps earlier. And uh, so you basically try to evaluate. You identify, you evaluate, then you try to quantify, then you try to prioritize, then you plan on some actions there. And you document the activities so these can be followed up later on. Purpose and benefits, there are obviously are pretty major benefits of doing FMEA. This is something that's uh, because of its logical nature. And it is done quite frequently. It's done quite frequently to be able to uh, take care of this. Benefits of FME again, I've repeated this, I've, I've mentioned this before, I repeat it again. It leads to higher reliability, better quality, increased safety, and as customer satisfaction. It also leads to cost savings. It also leads to what we call continuous improvement. And there are some examples. There are some examples there when it says, if it costs 100 when it is discovered in the field, that's a pretty high cost. It may cost dollar ten if it is discovered during final test. These are like the product development uh, life cycle stages. It may cost only one dollar if the problem is discovered during an incoming inspection. This is like before the before you put the took that part and you put that put, assembled it in, in a complete system there. 
She looked at your transistors on the chips and so on before they entered the system. And it's even better if you can do this, all this right at the design stage itself. So start your DF, start your design, start, start your FMEA right at the design stage itself. And this is called DFMEA. What are the tools available to be able to do this? There's benchmarking available. There may be other people who are doing this job better. Customer warranty reports that can lead to failure indices and so on, support, design checklists or guidelines, field complaints, internal failure analysis, internal test standards, lessons learned, return materials reports, expert knowledge, and certainly warranty service. These are the sources from which you can find out how things, how different things can go wrong, in what modes do they fail, what is their impact, what is their likelihood. All these things can be found if you've got a good, da good database. What are the possible outcomes? What if you would do would do FMEA. You can discover the uh, failure modes and uh, it can lead to uh, uh, meeting certain legal requirements that also can be there. Duty cycle requirements can also be impacted. Product functions obviously can be impact impacted by doing this. Some of the key product characteristics, those can be enhanced by doing this and certainly product verification and validation. Validation is the actual use. Verification means it confirms to specs. And uh, of course, to be able to do FMA, you've got to do your P team meeting, which is like guys would be sitting around and they would be basically getting briefed on it. And here's a little example, a performed DFMA. So the team has been now looked, asked to, uh, we, we are trying to design a new pressure cooker and uh, what all things could go wrong with this. And for that, you'll start uh, your uh, <coughs> basically approach determine the scope, what is it that we are trying to do, uh, gather background, reference material and so on and so forth. I am going to give you one or two illustrations on this. Create block diagrams so it is easy to understand what the process is, what is actually going on. Identify team members, prepare the agenda, schedule and milestones and of course identify item functions, failure modes and their effect. This is something we should be able to do. For the pressure cooker, safety valve releases pressure before it reaches dangerous level. This could be like one one, uh, this is this is its function. These are the safety functions. The, the, it could fail because if if this, for some reason, if the safety valve does not release, that could lead to a major explosion. Thermostat opens circuit through a coil before temperature rises above 250 Celsius, and this also is a dangerous situation. So the thermostat, so the safety valve could fail, or the thermostat could fail, or the pressure gauge. It's divided into green and red areas and danger is indicated when the pointer is in the red section there. Now, there could be a problem there also. So, you can actually see three modes of failure right away. Define the scope. That means, let's take a look at these systems there and you could look at the electrical system or you could look at the safety valve, thermostat, pressure gauge, whatever you want to focus. Your, your focus is going to be safety. And for that, you again start with the block diagram, which is like the pressure cooker, safety valve, pressure gauge. These are subcomponents of it. It's like your FTA, this is very much like your FTA. The electrical system could fail because of heating coil failure or cord failure or plug failure there. And the safety valve could fail because of valve spring not functioning properly or the valve casing not functioning properly. There are certain assumptions you make, you make sure that the components that are used, those are functioning properly. And that, that could lead, that could lead to basically a uh, problem in uh, failure. So again, let's get right back to our worksheet and let's review what we've done so far. Some function is not being delivered. This is something we'd like to be able to check, we'd like to be able to prevent. Potential causes for this, in what different ways could this function stop? So for example, the engine doesn't work, in what different reasons, what different reasons are there why the engine does not work? What is the effect of it? Well, you, you can see right away what would be the effect of the engine not starting there. What is the severity? What is the impact of it? And uh, then, of course, I've got some class, and that will depend on the severity class there, as I showed you earlier. Potential causes or the mechanisms of, of failure, this would be like your mode. And you do your cause and effect diagram there. Occurrence, this is again the probability of it. And current design control, do they do, they, do, they do some prevention or do they do detec detection? And then detection rate, this is something that I've also got to figure out. So I have these three quantities, severity, occurrence, likelihood, and detection capability. These lead to my RPN. And the highest RPN would immediately get some attention there. So there'll be some recommendation given to, to take care of this. Response, 
and target completion date. These are there. Who is going to be taking that action there and some other follow-ups there are there. So this is the worksheet that you should end up doing this. And uh, I have these slides here. And these slides will be there. You can just flip through them up to a certain point. They will tell you what are the functions expected, what are the how failure modes are going to take place, what how are you going to discover the effects of that failure there. How are you going to find your severity? How are you going to find the class? How are you going to find the different ways, causes of failure? How are you going to find the frequency of occurrence? How are you going to find the current design controls if they are there? How are you going to look at the detection capability? How are you going to calculate the RPM? This is something you'd like to be able to do. And of course, you want to be able to make sure that the high RPM items are there, all looked at before you go very further and recommended actions, of course. This is something that you've got to be able to end with when you end up with your FMEA. You've got some FMEA actions there. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your spending time in uh, browsing through these uh, videos there. And we are uh, approaching fast the uh, end of this uh, 40s, 40s session uh, sequence of uh, our lecture on Six Sigma. So the course will be ending with two more lectures. And there are two very interesting topics that are coming up for you in the next two lectures. So, see you soon. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.